for anyone watching on subsequent video, um, I'm here a few minutes early to start the session so that uh, when people start turning up, they can get in because we've got security features such that the session uh, can only be started by the account for the group. Um, we usually start about five after, so you may want to fast forward by you know five or ten minutes. Welcome, folks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put the link in the chat for the uh, meeting minutes. If folks could go ahead and please add themselves as attendees there. Also, we tend to start about five minutes after or so. Um, so we will definitely get going roughly then. It takes a little while for folks to trickle in.
for folks just joining the call, I'm going to stick a link in the chat to the meeting minutes. If you could please add yourself to the attendees. Uh, we typically get going about five after or so in about three minutes or so. Gives folks some time to trickle in. For folks just joining the call, I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat. You could please go add yourselves to the attendees list. I think we're probably going to get going any minute now, as soon as Frederick is ready to take to you know take us off. If there's someone on the call who could please share the meeting minutes on the call, that would be super super appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, we'll get started in a few more moments. Just waiting for uh, my meeting notes to appear. Great, let's get started. So welcome to the next uh, Network Service Mesh uh, community call. We have this call every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific. We also participate in a variety of referring events, including the CNCF Telecom User Group, which occurs every first Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific and uh, 4 a.m. Pacific, um, which occurs every, it's every first Monday of the month. Uh, the next one will be at the, uh, the earlier time slot. The, we also participate in the CNCF SIG network, which occurs every first and third Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific. We have a link in the, in the meeting notes that you can use to subscribe. We also have a series of major events that we are going to participate in. So um, tonight, in the if you look up uh, Go San Francisco in uh, on meetup.com, uh, you can sign up. I'm going to be talking about zero trust security. Um, I also am scheduled to talk at HPE Discover, but there, I don't have all the information on that just yet. I just know it's gonna be the end of July. The topic will be Zero Trust Security. We also have KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon, Europe uh, Virtual Edition, where uh, we are going to be run, where we're gonna have uh, some, a couple talks there. And we also have a, uh, NSMCon, KubeCon EU that we are waiting for information on, uh, and then we will be working on scheduling all that up. 
Um, we also have ON, ONES North America. The schedule should already be out for, for that. Uh, we do not have any talks. Uh, I know that I, I, I know that I did not uh, submit in, submit anything uh, substantial to that that's NSM related. Uh, I don't think uh, I don't think anyone else in the community did for this specific one either. Um, we have KubeCon Cloud Native Con North America coming up for Boston, and the CFP for that is currently open. The CFPs are going to close uh, very soon. Um, do you, does anyone remember the exact day the CFPs close? It was not June twelfth. It was uh, it was uh, shortly after that, like twenty eight. Yeah, I think yeah, twenty eight. Yeah, it, it, it's actually and it, it, if you feel like you're you're like like you're completely screwed in the head and you're misremembering the dates all the time, you're not. They're moving. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so. It was originally, it was like <clears throat> the 12th and then it became, you know, it, it was originally actually even earlier than the 12th and then it moved out and then it moved out and then it moved out and now we're at the 28th, so. But it hasn't been used to exclusive also. You cannot be both screwed in the head and, uh, and based on your movie. <laughs> I know I am, <laughs> yes. Uh, there's, there's only one cure to this problem, submit now. That, yes. that will definitely solve the problem. There's no question about that. Um, simultaneously, uh, we also have, um, we, we're also looking at the um, NSM North America events um, when we have more information from the CNCF on what is going and uh, what the zero event stays look like and we will have more information here. Yeah, um, uh, just, just so folks know, you know, effectively, the delay in all of this really comes down to the the sort of the, the amazing folks in, in the Linux Foundation and CNCF events teams are just running flat out trying to cope with the change in the landscape that we have right now. And so, you know, inputs to our process for this that we would normally have had long since because they were really good at getting ahead of everything have been slowed down by that because they've got to refigure out things that for them was just, you know, utterly habitual because they were so good at them. Um, so we, we do expect these things to come together. It just may take a little more time, um, not so much on our end, but the, the inputs to us. Yeah, and remember, it's more than just KubeCon. There's Automotive and Edge and uh, and Open Source Summit and uh, and all the flavors of those. Like it would not surprise me if there's around thirty to forty conferences that they're that they're scheduling, of which a significant portion of them have to get. Um, have to get uh, moved or virtualized. So but the fact that they are keeping up with this, even though there's a bit of a delay, is is absolutely stunning. Yeah, no, it, it's it's one of those things where they're, you know, we knew they were amazing, but you never know how amazing until they're under stress. So, but I, I did want to update the community on that because normally we're a bit, we're not crisp, but we're normally crisper than this, um, and we're just waiting for the inputs that we need. We also have social media uh, community information. So we have added seven um, seven followers, and we are following two more. Uh, we've put out twenty three uh, total tweets on a variety of topics. Uh, a portion of those are uh, weekly webinars and uh, events that are going on. Uh, we also have. Um, have reshared information about trainings and uh, VMware open source blogs on building an open source strategy. Uh, we also cross posted all of this into LinkedIn. Uh, so if LinkedIn is your preferred mechanism, you can follow us there. Uh, we have plans as well to retweet the um, contributor podcasts and blogs and LF events as they, as they come up. And as we learn more information, we will also share the information on NSM um, NSMCon and uh, KubeCon related sessions uh, on Twitter as well. Um, and so I will also post the, uh, the GoSF stuff uh, on Twitter uh, later today as well, so that people know where to register. Um, Excellent. With, with that, uh, let's go into the main agenda. We have at the top of the agenda, the, regist the registry API refactor. 
So we've been uh, busy trying to simplify the, um, the API and simplify it across a number of factors. Number one, number one is ease of use for, uh, for developers. The second one is uh, also refactoring it so that we can uh, increase the, the overall scalability of the system as the number of uh, endpoints increases as well. Um, and uh, through through the reduction of, uh, of of calls to the database and and streaming information in a uh, in a clean way. So who's going to? I don't have a name on this. So who is the person who's going to take this one up? So I think Denise has done a lot of the work on this. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to say, Denise, about that work. Um, I mean, I, I could definitely go and and take folks, I can you know, let you share or I can take folks to the, the PR either way. Denise? I think, I think Denise is still muted. I know yeah. he, was ha he was having a little bit of difficulty earlier um, with Zoom, so he, that may be actually what's going on. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and open the, the PR. Okay. And we'll give people a quick API walk through. Room. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know how everyone else's brain, brain works, but my brain primarily works in terms of proto for these things. <clears throat> So, I mean, I can, I can talk to it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so the network service endpoint is still a thing. Uh, we did realize that it's possible that the same network service endpoint may be registering more than one network service. Um, and that, that actually gets to be um, a thing because um, you know, if you've got an endpoint that's registering more than one network service, you need to be able to correctly represent it. And you also need to be able to represent the labels that were used for advertising each of those services. Um, we've simplified down. It, it, it turns out that um, when we simplified the API on the request close network server side, that a network service manager essentially just becomes another network service endpoint in the chain, helping you fulfill your needs. And so we don't need to call it out as a separate entity here. We just need a URL for how you reach the network service endpoint. Uh, with the request close monitor API. Um, and so when uh, an NSE in Kubernetes registers with its local network service manager on its node, that node uh, can substitute its URL uh, in that registration when that goes up. So that gets quite a bit simpler. And then you've also got the question of like, how do you know that this is a going concern? Um, and so in keeping with what we've done with things like the connection expiration, we basically have attached an expiration time to the registration so that, you know, if you go to do a lookup for network service endpoints um, and you've got one, but it's expired, you probably shouldn't go try and talk to an expired network service endpoint. So this gets enormously simpler. Um, and then moving to sort of a very basic, you know, register, monitor, find, unregister semantics for network service endpoints as a registry. And then the, the, the other piece that we sort of came to was if you, if you orthogonalize the registration of, of endpoints and network services um, such that the only sort of touch point is the name of the network service, you get some really lovely behavior in terms of modularity, uh, scalability, and also simplicity of code. So in addition to having a registry for network service endpoints, you also can register your network services Again, same semantics, it just happens that the thing you're registering is the network service object. Um, and then, you know, basically structuring the, the sort of queries around them, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's the basic change, essentially. The whole API gets quite a bit simpler. Any sort of comments, questions? Anything else? Oh, there's one way to do it. Are you separating the registration of the service from the registration of the service endpoint, or right? Exactly. But it doesn't right. mean that only one can do the service registration, or can many do that? Oh, in terms of registering the service? Yeah. Um, Should yeah, they so coordinate? In yeah, in, in principle, that's possible. 
Um, it, it sort of depends on who's doing the registration of the service and why. So for mm -hmm. example, um, you know, if I, you know, historically, if I'm a network service manager, one of the things that we've done is if there's not already a network service out there uh, for the thing that the NSC is registering for, we've historically gone and registered one that's sort of like the minimum possible network service for that. Um, and, and, you know, that, so that, that essentially becomes sort of a thing that you can do. The, the other thing with network services and their registration that's interesting is I, because network service objects contain a certain amount of policy, um, I would expect that often the, the entity that's registering the network service might be a human being pushing a network service object uh, via mm -hmm. a tool mm -hmm. rather than necessarily the um, necessarily the network service endpoint or some network service manager that's acting on its behalf. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I mean, uh, but maybe I, I don't know if I follow because it's also like this, uh, you can see cardinality as a thing. I mean, maybe you want to have one IPAM, but many like workers. But that's if you, oh. if not oh, oh, yeah. So, so basically, a, a network service is an abstract thing, right? Yeah. So I, you know, just to take an example, that's sort of a classic example for us of secure internet connectivity. I might register a single network service under the name secure internet connectivity, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a single thing. Getting back to your point about cardinality, which, by the mm -hmm. way, is a, a I, I love cardinality. It's an awesome word. Um, and then, but you then may have many, many uh, registrations of network service endpoints that provide that network service. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and that that's that that's definitely true. I mean, the other thing that we did here that's kind of a little bit subtle, I want to call out, is on the find call. Um, rather than returning uh, sort of a, a, a single a message that has a list of network service endpoints, we switched to using a stream. And the reason we did that is around scalability. Um, because it turns out there is a maximum size to um, gRPC messages. And also, it turns out that, you know, obviously, you can flood out your memory and whatnot. And I don't expect this to actually be an issue for sort of what you might call network service endpoints on the line. Um, but you could imagine a situation as you wind up with things up the hierarchy in the system where you might be passing around or, re or asking about a fairly large number of network service endpoints. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we have the ability to scale up, right? So for example, you could imagine a situation where I've got a VL3 network service endpoint. And you could very easily imagine asking to find all of your peers, right? Because you want to go build out your topology between them. Um, and so you could see that network service endpoint potentially making that query. Well, you know, we're all networking people. How long do you think it's going to take before there are hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of peers among these VL3s? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a stream. And does it mean I cannot do for, for each in the stream or something? I mean, it, it's like... Uh, it oh, you can absolutely, you can, you can absolutely do for each in a stream. In fact, actually, um, there was a pull request that was merged after this that contains some helper functions. Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Um, because it was realized that often what you really want is exactly that for each semantics. Um, and it, it, it's, it's actually, this is not the one I wanted. Uh, this is it. And it, it's not that um, you, you, know, you do want semantics like that often. And it's not hard, as you can see here. But why have everyone do it themselves? So if you really, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're doing a situation where you expect this to be finite from a memory point of view, you can just call these in, you know, in order to extract out a list. Now, so you create a list of the, of the stream or, or the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially you, you, you pull out a list by consuming mm -hmm. the stream. Now, if you... The moment, I assume, then, because that's what is different. Why would it be a stream? Otherwise, it is, it is, I pull a list for, at a given moment in time, is it like that? So, so think of it this way. If I have uh, if I if I have ten thousand responses, yeah. I I will overflow the maximum size of a gRPC message, mm -hmm. right? So first of all, you 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 literally break the underlying transport. Um, mm -hmm. Plus, also, if I have ten thousand responses, maybe I I will end up shifting how I consume this in my network service endpoint 
to be a little more streamy, if that makes sense. So rather than pulling an array to consume, you know, some subset of this as I go. So one, um, one change that I would enjoy seeing as well is instead of, uh, or in addition to being able to provide a list, having, uh, having something that, uh, that it, uh, will post to a channel whenever the, uh, whenever receive is, is true would, uh, would be helpful. Because then oh, you can do the that's iteration. that's super smart. Yes, you can you range can over that. that. Yeah, you can do the range over that. And it also has nice semantics from a, uh, from a, uh, um, uh, from a threading perspective because you're, mm. it creates another Go routine at that point, or you create another Go routine, mm -hmm. have it listen in on yeah. that. And I, does right I, actually, I actually like that a great deal because I think that the things we actually care about here are not the, the, the arrayness of it. I don't actually think we mostly care about that. I think mostly what we care about is the ability to range over it. Um, yeah, and, and so that, that I think could potentially be another really, really lovely helper here. Um, yeah, and it also also has a much nicer semantic in terms of like, if, if you're trying to, to do an iteration, you, do a, you, you do, get a list and then you try getting a list again at a at a at another time. Like, does it start off? Does does it run from where it left off from from updates? Like, it makes the semantics are much easier as well to to understand. Yeah, no, I I, I, I could see that. Does that does that make sense to you as well? Yeah, to me, it does. I mean, I was just asking my conceptual. I mean, I don't I don't have a specific use case for this. I was thinking, well, how would I do? I mean, you can also you could also do like a subscription of of uh, when things add to the group or something. I don't know. Oh yeah, and that that's actually sort of like let me go back a bit. Um, huh? So you we 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 were sort of sorting out a little bit. We've got this. Um, we've got fine. And again, we're still sorting this out a little bit. So input on this would be super welcome, by the way. So we got find, which basically is letting you sort of say, I would like all the things right now. And then we've got monitor, which is sort of a, a you know, it's a, it's a placeholder. It needs a little bit of work, frankly, but it's a placeholder for sort of the, um, tell me what you have right now and update me as things change. Yeah, that's that cool. Yeah, I mean, you, you get, you get the first, first you get like uh, the current situation and you cannot be interrupted so you can build your own structure. And then you get updates running after that when you're done. Oh, absolutely. And one of the nice things about this and one of the reasons that I actually think this is sort of super important is um, we want to make the system as resilient as possible, right? Mm -hmm. And what, part of what resiliency means is you want to build the world so that anything can die or rather mm -hmm. anything can restart. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine yeah. a network service endpoint that registers itself and then calls monitor, right? Yeah. And essentially monitors for itself. And if it essentially, if it discovers that, in fact, you know, suddenly the registry doesn't know about it, say because the registry restarted, then it probably needs to re-register itself expeditiously. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if we look for the awareness in the world of itself, yeah. I mean that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, th this is so. I, I I have this this interesting thing that I do in my head that I, I sort of think of this way. You, you know, I, I know, Anders, you came up in the telco world, so you probably went through the whole phase where suddenly everything had to be HA, right? Yep. Everything yep. had to be HA. And what HA usually meant was building very complicated shared state things so that if one of them went away, you could survive. And, and a lot of the cloud native thinking is more in the direction of what I would call resiliency, which means if something goes yep. wrong, you can go make it right again. Um, and you want to distribute the make it right as broadly as you can. But coming from telco, it's very easy to get into the HA trap, actually. It's very well, easy it was, to pull. Yeah. what's super dangerous about the HA trap, in my experience, frankly, yeah. is it's really easy on the cloud native side to get flippant and say, if you're doing HA, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> and and the, the truth is, that's not always true. There are still places where we still, for very good reasons, have HA in the system. Right? So just look at the Kubernetes API server, right? You can deploy mm -hmm. that with at CD and Raft. Now, it also mm -hmm. happens that, that intelligent things that are built around it, um, like Kubelet, et cetera, are resilient to that API server um, becoming unavailable, right? So if you lose your API server, 
um, none of your workloads on any given node have any issues really, right? They just keep on keeping on. Yeah, they go um, all continue. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and, and, and so you, you have both resiliency and HA there. But, but I, I would say probably the less flippant statement, which is if you, find your, if you think you need HA, the probability that, that you actually don't and that you need your, what you need is resilience is much higher in cloud native than in previous ways of thinking about the world. So yeah, it, it's, it's tricky. Um, absolutes are almost, you know, I'll make it a totally paradoxical statement. Absolutes are never correct. <laughs> So. Well, in the cloud native world, I mean, it's easy when you just have like a query response. I mean, but you can see the, you can see the same problem with the big BGP router that loses all its TCP connection. It will, uh, it will cause like a lot of disturbance in the network. So then it, HA would be better, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, reconvergence is a thing as you start adding more zeros to the end of your state. Um, definitely, yeah, and, and, and that's sort of the, 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 the trade-off back and forth. Um, in that regard. <clears throat> so anyway, um, but that's kind of the way that this is all thinking. Um, further input on the monitor and the find APIs would be super, super, super welcome, particularly. I mean, obviously input on the, the entire uh, shift in the API is welcome, but we sort of know on monitor and find that we're just sort of feeling our way through the best way of dealing with them. Um, and so, you know, that would be you know, super, super helpful if you had thoughts and wanted to push PRs to talk through those thoughts. But is this the new stuff now? Can I check this? Can I check it out and and, uh, and run some ICMP responder on it or something? Or is it still? Uh, we're we're, we're, we're getting thing? actually we're getting actually very close to that. So I think right now the the state of things is I have a PR up on the command forwarder that mm -hmm. um, does actually have working ICMP and the testing for it. Um, so that's up and a working thing. And not only does it have working ICMP, but it also does that in working ping, but it does working ping for um, slash 32s, which we did not previously have, um, which you know, speaking personally makes me very happy because I, I, I cringe every time I you know, go and drop a, a, a slash 30 in order to cover a link. It just uh -huh. makes me sad. Uh -huh. um, but what, so, you, what, what is the command for? Is it an agent for VPP or is it something else? Uh, the, the command forwarder VPP agent yeah. is literally just a forwarder that happens to be built on VPP agent um, mm -hmm. that allows you to do, um, you know, that basically handles cross connects. So you can think of it as something for, as a network service endpoint that provides cross connect service. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So, and the things that it, it is, the things that it is, it is set up to handle right now are um, for me local mechanisms of kernel and MemIF and for remote mechanisms of VXLAN and SRV6. Mm -hmm. Although I will point out that the SRV6 code has never been used in anger yet. Um, <laughs> right, so. Uh, but, uh, this functionality was before in the, in the data plane or in the forwarder and now it's more generalized. So what, exactly, can... exactly. And, then, and there's the command, and it's living in the command forwarder VPP agent repo. So if you want to go take a look at the code there, you can go take a look at it. Although I would strongly suggest look at the one outstanding PR because that's sort of where the pieces are evolving forward with the testing uh -huh. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, another question this with the, with the foreigners. Have you ever looked at Kota containers? Because that's another project I'm working with. I'm trying to think, will that work really with, with NSM? Uh, so probably. So I, 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 I know the Kata guys, they're, they're super smart mm -hmm. guys. Um, you know, and, and, and they're, they're taking on a very ambitious problem. So just, just to sort of hum a few bars, you correct me if I say it wrong, <clears throat> what Kata Containers is really doing is trying to run an ultra, ultra, ultra lightweight VM as if it were a container. Um, and yeah, it turns they, out there's a... Mm -hmm. they, they actually implement the, uh, the, if I recall properly, they actually call, uh, implement the OCI spec um, as a as a uh, hypervisor manager. Um, and so you can, so you, you can stick it under underneath container D. So you so you bring in container D, but instead of container D calling run C, it'll call uh, Kata containers. Kata containers uh, can be configured with multiple south, uh, southbound uh, uh, VM uh, hypervisors as well. So you can, you can point it towards uh, a lightweight uh, KVM or, Q or QEMU-based uh, system. 
you can also point it towards uh, Firecracker. Now, the question on whether NSM works or not in these scenarios is going to be uh, based upon how the networking is, is set up. So I'm expecting if you want to use something like QEMU, we're, we're going to probably have to do a little bit of work in order to wire in the, the networking components just right. But if you're using, uh, if, if you're using Firecracker, uh, if I recall properly, Firecracker uh, ends up uh, uh, exposing things uh, directly into, it has its own TCP IP stack that, uh, that, if, that I believe ends up exposing itself directly over whatever name, network namespace that it's, uh, that it's in. And uh, that just happens to be the kernel, the, the network namespace of your, of your, what traditionally would be your pod, and that would continue to work from there. I'll have to verify this just to make sure that my information mm -hmm. is correct, but I believe that's how that's how it's set up. Uh, and so the so your the short term your mileage will vary, but there's nothing in NSM that would prevent us from creating a mechanism that's designed to work with that specific type of, uh, of thing. Of course, if you're dealing with uh, with Firecracker VMs, then landing something like shared memory into the pod will be difficult because they don't expose that out. They don't want there to be any pinned memory. So you could get, uh, that's how they get Lambda working with high, uh, with high density is by making sure everything in the, uh, in the VM is swappable so that you, uh, so you can swap it in and, and out as, as necessary. Uh, but uh, the network namespace portion, I believe is still, uh, is still kernel based. It just, uh, it just forms the packet and then uh, basically uses net uh, uh, rock the NetRock capability to then craft a packet and, and ship yeah. it off so, to you. So I, I, think, I think the other thing is, so I, I'm actually excited that you're working on this and, and I would love to collaborate on figuring out how to drop, uh, you know, basically how to use network service mesh mechanisms to drop connectivity into a Kata container. Um, I can think of like at least three ways to approach it. One is the one that Frederick just described. The second one that occurs to me is that Kata, if you're running with QEMU is supporting vhost user, correct? Yeah, I think so. We use, they use VSocket and VHost use, but that's Firecracker to VSocket. I, I, I looked a bit at it, but it, I mean, you know, it's based on that using CNIs, and then they take the interface and move it in a bridge, and then they put the Mac V tap into the VM. And, and that wouldn't work here because our forwarder or the NSM forwarder will put it straight into the container, and there somebody needs to move it into, into the VM. So we would need yeah. to do something the agent of the of the Kata stuff, of Kata Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, like I said, I can think of several ways of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you ping me on Slack, I would love to chat through some of this. And like I said, I'm always looking for a good excuse to work with the Kata guys. They're great guys, <laughs> um, you know. So, and, and the other thing is, it, it sort of gets directly to, you know, a, a central personal ambition that I have, which is as a matter of personal ambition, I would like to see workloads land in Kubernetes as just workloads. And the Kata mm -hmm. guys really, really, really land in Kubernetes as just workloads. And so being able to allow them with network service mesh to mm -hmm. go ahead and connect to whatever network services they need would probably solve a ton of their problems and probably allow a whole lot of people with existing VMs to just slide smoothly in. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I I also have a, uh, a use case for it that I eventually want to, to run as well. Um, and so my plan, uh, and this is just the plan at this particular point, has always been to eventually revisit the entire Kata container stuff and to put some resources towards, uh, towards getting NSM to work with it. Because um, I have a use case where uh, having the additional security um, having the additional security boundaries that a VM provides you is uh, is uh, beneficial, and uh, would would love to see that would love to see that path uh, just just work. So, uh, if you're if this is an area that's of high interest to you, uh, yeah, they're definitely include me in, and I'll I'll see if I can if I can help in that space. What would be perfect is if we could get a memif into like a virtual machine or something, because it would be fast. The um, the people the people from Firecracker are are interested in some of these things as well, and I can point to you. I can connect you to some of those people. I don't know what VM you're using underneath, but if uh, if you're looking at Firecracker, I've I've already had conversations with that uh, with their networking team, and I'm happy to introduce you if if you're yeah. looking to do work in that space. I got yeah. stuck on Firecracker. 
Cracker. I can start Firecracker as it is, but I cannot run it in Kubernetes for some weird reason. It, it fails all the time. Yeah, but, but it, this is actually exciting, and, and particularly on the MemIO stuff, I would think that the tricky bit on the MemIO stuff is being able to get a socket directory uh, mounted into the Kata container. But I suspect that that's a fairly well-solved problem because I think in the normal course of affairs that if I, you know, if I have a, a, a Unix socket that is running, you know, that, that it, I, I think that will work in terms of passing memory between in and out of the mm -hmm. VM with standard QEMU. Obviously, somebody needs to go try that. But that would actually be super cool because then stuff that's running in your VMs basically interfaces the world, the world exactly the same way as stuff that's running in your containers. Um, yeah, it, it would be fast, wouldn't it? Because it would be like a DPDK way. I mean, the VM would go straight into the switch, to the DPT switch. I mean, it, it would be like a packet is, a, is a put on the memory and used out directly. Yep, yep. Your I, yep. Yeah, no, this is actually super cool stuff. Um, so, you know, do feel free to raise a conversation and, and uh -huh. sort of ping me by name on PandaSM or PandaSM dev. I, I, uh -huh. I'd love to actually see this move forward because it's a, it's a good test case. Plus, our ambition really is to be able to support any workload anywhere. And uh -huh. this, is, this is a good space to explore that with VMs. Yeah, but I will look a bit more into it, and then I will, then I will maybe. Okay, no, that, that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, then, right. sorry, the off topic. Back to the back to the APIs again. <laughs> cool. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Should um, sh so in terms of repo uh, pipeline naming, should we swap that for the multi IP context one? Uh, I think that the third one. I think is slightly. More, I, I, more I'm, 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 I'm happy to do that. Um, although I'm hoping that the multi-IP in, in connection context is not controversial. It um, should not be. I just want awareness for, for people and I prefer not to run out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally, totally. Um, so uh, for this one, it, it, and I've pushed this PR up. Um, essentially, what it comes down to is that there are lots of places where it turns out you're going to want more than one IP. Um, for source and dust IP um, <clears throat> across the V wire. Now the obvious one um, is going to be for IPv4, IPv6 dual stack. Um, but I'm sort of curious about things that other folks have in mind in terms of other use cases for this. Uh, I wanted to have the one with the load balancer. That's why I put in the, the map again. I mean, <laughs> you know, because the load balancer, you have a VIP address. Mm -hmm. And you want yeah. the, the VIP address out on the, on the, on the workload. Okay, so load, ba load balancer VIPs is another example. Yeah, and with, with no NAT. I mean, so you, you really want to have the VIP address on the on the workload to be able to do direct server return or something like this. Yeah, and, and like one of the things actually that, that quite frankly, you know, that, that happens is if you do your load balancer VIP with uh, multi IP the way that, that I'm suggesting here, um, yeah. <clears throat> then you don't have to actually do any work. Right now, if you've got a map for your load balancer VP, uh, VIP, you've got to do work. Yeah, but, you... but I didn't think map. I mean, NAT, I mean, without doing a network address translation. That's why you need to have a VIP address on the workload. If you do a NAT, you don't need to do that. But if you really want to have a VIP, yeah, you yeah, want yeah, to yeah, have... yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, dude, I'm 100% I'm, I'm with you because I, I, NAT is a terrible, terrible way to do load balancing mechanically if you're a network guy. We have so many better tools than this. Wait, right? you're not saying um, it's NAT troll? It is deeply unnatural. Um, I mean, to begin with, I don't know if you've seen the. I have to be nice. It's good for a topology hiding at this, actually. I think. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but I mean, little things like I don't know if you've seen the maglev style load balancing stuff. Yeah, yeah, everything we did, we we did the pork with it. It works well. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it's great. Um, plus, mm. there are other things you can do as well. Um, there's some interesting and sophisticated things you can do with. Um, SRV6 load balancing as well uh, that you could also imagine doing. But for all of them, what you really end up wanting is, as you said, you want to go attach the VIP to the interface. Yeah. Um, the maglev you have in VPP is, is like is like done for this because you set up a set of GRE tunnels and you put the VIP address on the GRE tunnel. Then mm -hmm. it works right out of the box. I mean. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. um, no, and there's actually a good example of that. I think that Yahoo Japan completely replaced their hardware load balancers with the maglev style load balancing in VPP. 
Um, there's a whole talk out there uh, I, I can dig up where they, they talk about how much better it is to do in software, which is a little scary when you're a hardware guy like we are. So big idea in F5, really sad. Yep. Okay, so the, the, the load balancer VIPs is another good one, actually, yeah. now that you mention it. Cool. Um, anything else? Yeah, I can think about what, what, we call, what is it called? VRRP, maybe. <laughs> I'm sorry. If what? you want to VRRP stuff, you need to have like multiple analysis, don't you? Yep, yep. No, I can totally see that. Um, plus, God help us all. I mean, you know, the, the old V6 heads wanted to put a, a slash 64 on every interface in the world. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know why. That, that strikes me as the same level of, of silliness as, you know, 16 million loopback addresses. Um, but oh. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever makes you happy. Um, but yeah, but mechanically speaking, it's not a big change. Essentially, all you wind up with is multiple IP source and desk IPs in the IP context. The, um, I, I did want to make sure we got, you know, awareness of this, that we had people look at it, um, et cetera. It seems like it's likely to be uncontroversial, but I do want to make sure I get the downstream fixes in place uh, before we proceed. But it, it is the source that is, a, that is associated with the workload, isn't it? It's the what? It's the source IP that will be associated with the workload. The source IP is going to be associated with the workload, but yeah. if you think about the IPv, the, and I, I thought about this too, right? Like, do you just need mm -hmm. multi IPs for the source? But if I've yeah. got, for example, a dual stack v4, v6, for mm -hmm. example, they were, yeah. then, yeah, then yeah, you could... I, I was thinking of if, say, I, I, put, I put in a lot of different, different IP addresses here now. Who has the responsibility of setting them? Because that was the forward that does this usually. So if well, I have so, like four different, who will set those on the on the pod on the workload? Yeah. So if if the workload is using a kernel interface, that would remain the responsibility of the forwarder. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, the, the, otherwise it's part of the protocol, isn't it? That's the easy case. If you use MEM for something, it's part of the protocol. Yeah. The, the the basic assumption is if you're not using a kernel interface, then you're uh, probably smart enough to handle that yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you know, it, it, it's, yeah. So, I mean, like that, that, that was kind of the thought, but yeah, this would be the responsibility to set them then at the forwarder. Um, and, and also to one of the things that I've actually done, this is probably worth mentioning and uh, discussing briefly here is um, with the, in order to support slash 32 IP addresses, if I get a response back to the forwarder, that has a slash 32 source and a slash 32 dust, or actually, let me be more generic. If I get back a response from forwarder where the source IP, um, the network for the source IP does not contain the dust IP, then I actually am programming a route that points out the interface for the dust IP. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That is normal, is that correct to do that? That is what you would do. If you get I feel to, like if it's normal. I feel if like you it's, have a test that is within, that is not on your subnet, you would have to put a route, don't you? Otherwise, you can't reach it, right? So right. As, far as, yeah. as far as I can yeah. tell, you basically get two choices here. Either yeah. you insert a route and you can reach the dust IP on the other end of the V wire, or mm -hmm. you don't. If you yeah. don't, then you can't reach the dust IP on the other side of the V wire. So, um, I, I didn't expect that to be hugely controversial. Um, but I did want to sort of mention it. Cool. Anything else on multi-IP before we jump into repo pipelining naming? Is it just an array or, or can you tag a different IP addresses in a way or something? Or, or are you used a set of addresses equally? Uh, I, I think it's coming back as a list. Um, yeah. Basically, so I, I, I couldn't differ them. I cannot say that this is my VIP address and this is my my lower interface address. Uh, then I would have to use the map anyhow. And probably yeah, that's okay. That, that, that's that's true. Um, mm -hmm. But but it also it has a certain simplification to it, uh, in that now instead of having to have the responsibility for the thing in the map that is telling you that this is your VIP, now you mm -hmm. just have the responsibility for what whatever reason it is you need to know that it is. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, no. 
So. If I can be so, yeah, if I can handle them all in, in like a generic way, then that's much better. That's what you're saying. Or it has certain advantages, right? Yeah. And, and of course, there's there's no reason you have to do it that way. You could always no. drop back to the map okay. and not put it in there. But always on the map, yeah. Yep. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, cool. Anything else before we jump to repo pipelining? Oh yes, I have one moment for uh, registry IP refactor. Uh -huh. um, we have also simplified monitor methods for uh, network service reg registry and network service endpoints in the PR uh, 42. Ah, uh, was this the one with the helper functions? Oh, no, we have uh, just uh, get rid of uh, monitor methods and add a flag for monitoring in a query parameter. Ah, oh, okay. So, ah, oh, okay, apologies. So this essentially, I should have actually picked up on this. Uh, this is adding essentially a flag to the watch so that you just have the find mm -hmm. and that you can essentially either do a find in which case you'll get a stream of things that um, satisfy your query and then you're done or you can flag it as watch, in which case you'll get the updates, sort of like what we were discussing, Anders, with wanting to be able to get the updates from a single method. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah, this, um, from the, the code that uh, the protobuf generates, this, uh, it still makes sense to create some form of a, of a helper function to simplify this, because you have the, uh, you have this receive path, uh, this receive method you have to call in a for loop as opposed to being able to range over it still. But um, yeah, so having a helper method there, I think will will still be uh, will still be useful. Yep. No, this is this is good. Okay, so we've got those. That's fantastic. Um, so we're down to the last ten minutes. I do want to talk briefly about repo pipeline uh, pipeline naming, because this is something that has actually come up as we're making more forward progress. Uh, and, and I wanted to share this slide. This is a slide we've discussed uh, before when we first started doing the modular repos. But we're, we're sort of to the point where we've, we've got the API going, we've got the SDKs, the SDK platform stuff is going. Uh, commands are starting to land, command for, uh, forwarder VPP agent, command network service manager. I know um, that Frederick is working on a uh, ICMP responder NSE, um, which if anyone has any ideas on a better name than ICMP responder, that would be fantastic. Um, what can be better than that? I mean, we base all our pops on it. Everything we do is called ICMP responder. It doesn't matter what function it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, this thing is BGP. Oh, it's an ICMP responder. I, I guess on the <laughs> core, it, it always is. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, I think um, part of what we what I was thinking of is that the uh, the ICMP responder code that we created, um, while in, in addition to being a, an ICMP responder, also has the property of, uh, hey, I, I've set up some type of uh, of slash thirty two for you, or it could be something else, but we'll say for the moment it's like some I've set up some address you can connect over, and uh, it, your network service could actually be a web application or it could be BGP or, or something else. And so, yeah. yeah, an ICMP responder just doesn't capture the essence of everything that we can, uh, that we can do. Right. Yep. So this is, yeah, so I mean, but, but, but the point is the commands are coming online for the basic patterns. Uh, and so we're starting to get to the point where we're looking at actually standing up and doing integration testing of things, right? And so I wanted to revisit because when we originally did this slide, you know, obviously it was some months ago and we had some notion about the world, but you know, we've now got a little bit more experience with the multi-repo. We're trying to figure out sort of where we want to go from here. And at the time we did this, and again, I want to really emphasize the degree to which this was not a decision. It was sort of a, a musing. Uh, we were thinking about maybe having a repo for the Helm charts, um, you know, and a repo for the operator. Um, and then some repo we can keep the integration tests in and then having an integration repo for each platform. So obviously I think we probably start with like integration case kind here because that's the easiest one to start with and then start adding them for the various 
and sundry um, other environments like GKE, EKS, AKS, Packet, um, et cetera. Um, I, I sort of wanted to get folks' thoughts on how we might proceed from here, because we are getting to the point where we need to start creating some repos very shortly um, for some of the uh, things that are start getting up, getting up to integration level with Kubernetes. Don't all speak at once. So do we want a name for each component or do we want to give like the overall pipeline a, a name? I think we're just trying to figure out what, how we're going to name the things, right? Um, <clears throat> I mean, my, my, my suggestion would be from a, a a general point of view is that probably, so here's my kind of thought in terms of like how we start and then how we end up, which is, I think from a how we start point of view, it may make sense to start with an integration K8 uh, kind repo. Um, and then as we figure out, for example, what the Helm charts look like, we can pull those back to a Helm repo. Um, as we figure out what the integration tests look like, we can pull those back to an integration test repo. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I like this uh, I like this particular thing where um, part of what we need to do is we we run we run any gen make generators like an API like there's not there's not much for the API to test even though there are some unit tests that we that in time will add in for some developer functions uh, SDK and so on we run the, the run, run the unit test integrate them into the command so I mean that 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 path's pretty clear. Um, the area where it starts to get a little bit more interesting is what happens when you want to perform a, uh, when you want to do a very simple integration test. Because I think we want to do two forms of, of integration tests. One of them is we want to make sure that this thing installs, has some smoke test that shows that some, that some PR or some collection of, of changes over the pipeline has, uh, continues to work, uh, which could just be as simple as ICMP responder over, over kind. <clears throat> Uh, and then we want to proceed to a much larger set of integration uh, tests that occurs on a regular basis that are much more that are much more expensive. And in the long run, like it, it would be easy to see some of these type of integration tests take uh, uh, take a significant amount of time to run because some of them may may also turn into things like soak tests to make sure that uh, that uh, we're soak we're tests. Soap tests, upgrade tests, that kind of stuff. I can totally see that. Exactly. So I think this pattern is uh, this pattern is a is a good a good approach. It's relatively simple to follow along at this point. Adds complexity over over time, but keeps the initial touch points with the developers uh, short and sweet. And uh, one of the things that we're going to have to make sure that we get good at over time, from a tooling perspective, is that any changes that occur that we do a, a, a much longer running integration test uh, that we can, the one thing I would like to see is, uh, is the ability to have a list of what, of what PRs were accepted um, or what commits were accepted with, uh, with that so that when you see something break, then you can look at that list of PRs and have a good starting the, point. The, so that's the, probably the, the, the ability to, to, to the, basically the ability to backtrace, I think is going to be a, a huge deal. And we definitely exactly. do need to get a bit better about that um in terms of the propagation it, 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 you know and it, it, it gets where, where the where it really gets to be interesting is as you said when we get to the soak test where we're scooping up a bunch of uh, a bunch of stuff that happened over time that's where it gets to be very strange um, yeah because we want to we want to minimize the window that uh that that uh that that runs in so if we if we can minimize that uh, that window of prs then just from a debugging perspective it, it'll just make things so much easier and yeah. so, yeah, so that's... I, I know that, that, that Andre, you were the one who was chomping at the bit to get going with this stuff. Does it sound reasonable to you to start with an integration K8's kind repo uh, with the acknowledgement that we're going to eventually pull back out of it a helm at an integration tests and, uh, repos so that they can be shared across the different platform repos? Uh, as I discussed, as I remember, uh, a good point could be integration K was uh, it is uh, kind uh, since we could run kind inside Docker and no need to any particular cluster 
to be started. So probably we start with it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm actually not fully sure if we need different repositories for packet, Geeky, and so on, uh, because we still has cloud testing tool, which could uh, do uh, integration on all possible platforms at once. Yeah, I mean, part, part of the reason, frankly, that I, I would like, I, that I like this approach, it doesn't mean it's the way we end up, um, is that, let's say that we get a situation like literally just happened this week where somebody is running a, you know, running a case where they're running Kubernetes on top of OpenStack, right? Essentially, they're running on a different platform and they're yeah. having some sort of very bizarre, bizarre esoteric issues, right? <clears throat> It lets us basically cut a new repo and let them go work on that. Um, so it basically disaggregates the pieces of this. Or if you were to get, say, IBM coming in wanting to work on integration testing for IKS, right? It gets very, very easy. Or, um, for example, I know we have people right now working actively on open no, no, shift uh, integration. Yeah. Uh, all is okay. The question is uh, where you want to put the tests itself. For example, I, we have same test actually, for four platforms. Did we have a four copies of it? I, so th this is why I'm saying the integration test repo. Essentially, you, you, you pull those tests in from the integration test repo. Ah, OK. So it's just um, uh, CI running stuff. Uh, it, 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 exactly, right? And, and so effectively, if I go and I change, add an integration test, it could kick off across the platforms. Um, if I go and change the Helm charts, et cetera. Um, but I, I think from a getting going point of view, probably we want to start with integration case kind. And then once we sort of settled it in a little bit, we can pull integration tests out into their own repo. And we can pull Helm charts into their own repo. Does that make yep. sense? Yeah. Um, Cause I, I am sort of sensitive to the fact that there is working multi repo is working really nicely for us in most regards, but it's not free. Um, and when you're just trying to cobble things together, um, there could be costs involved. So for example, I know when you were first starting to get the network service manager going, you did a ton of work um, within the command network service manager repo. Um, and then you started pulling things back into the proper SDK repos. Cool. So we're hitting the top of the, of the hour. Um, is this something that, uh, we want to uh, add to the next week's agenda? Um, I, I, I think we probably do want to add it to the next week's agenda to continue the conversation. Is, would everybody be comfortable with starting at least with an integration case kind of repo at this time? I, I would be. Anybody else have opinions? All right. Excellent. I will talk to you guys next week. Take care.